This episode is brought to you by Viva. Now, I've talked a lot about uh, how we use Viva as a site and why it's great to not have to use paper binders anymore, how simple it is to drag and drop files uh, into Viva, classify them, and have them filed into a reg binder. But something else that's really cool about Viva is uh, they are the first public company to convert to a public benefit corporation. You know, there are a lot of sort of fly-by-night startups right now uh, in the clinical trial research space. Uh, so, you know, I love the fact that they are a public benefit corporation, which by definition has a legal duty to balance the interests of all concerned stakeholders, which means customers, employees, shareholders, and society as a whole. So when Viva launches a new technology or updates its applications, the entire company is actively thinking about the interest of its customers, including clinical trial sites. So... Uh, we're not talking about a company out here to make quick money grab, someone who's investing in clinical trial infrastructure and who really takes sites perspectives uh, in mind when they're building out their product. So uh, once again, you know, not only is it a great product to use, but you can feel good about working with Viva. So uh, to learn more, you know, check them out, sites.viva.com. I, I really can't talk enough about how uh, using Site Vault has changed our research sites and made life so much easier. Once again, that's sites.viva.com. This episode is also brought to you by Realtime CTMS. They are a leading provider of innovative software solutions for clinical trial research sites, site network sponsors, and CROs. Realtime systems allow users to manage complex clinical research processes with powerful user-friendly interfaces that are revolutionizing how research gets done. To get a free demo, check out the company's website at realtime-ctms.com and complete one of their contact forms. Hello and welcome to the Note to File podcast, a collection of interviews, best practices, and candid commentary for clinical research sites. I'm your host, Brad Hightower. Uh, this week we have a really interesting dude, Gunnar Esiason. Uh, Gunnar is a cystic fibrosis and rare disease patient leader who's passionate about early stage drug development, patient empowerment, and health policy. Uh, Gunnar has a you know huge list of accomplishments. Uh, he's been the face of fundraising fundraising efforts for Boomer Esiason Foundation, which has yielded more than 160 million for the fight against cystic fibrosis since he was diagnosed with the condition in 1993. Uh, he's got an MBA from Tuck School of Business at Dartmouth, an MPH from Dartmouth Institute for Health Policy and Clinical Practice, and a BA from Boston College. I also sits on the board of directors at the Boomer Esiason Foundation and No Patient Left Behind. Uh, he currently leads patient-facing strategy at Florence Healthcare. Uh, again, very interesting dude. I uh, love his insight. This week, we discuss Gunnar's experience as a clinical trial participant, uh, decentralized clinical trials, participant reimbursement, and so much more. So without further ado, Gunnar Esiason. All right, man. Welcome to the show, Gunnar Esiason. How's it going? Hey, Brad. Thanks for having me on. Things are good. Things are good. Excited to chat today. Yeah, it was, uh, it was cool to... Uh, it doesn't often happen, but I get to meet the guests beforehand. I was happy to see you at uh, Magi in Vegas. How was your uh, experience there? You know, it was a good conference. I feel like I'm a little bit on the conference roadshow right now. I've been in, <laughs> you know, I think it's like a new state every other week at this point. But Magi was good. Not a huge Vegas person. But no, I think I probably hadn't been there since the bachelor party like 10 years ago. But otherwise, <laughs> it was uh, it was a good trip. Good trip for sure. Yeah, no, same. I'm not necessarily the biggest Vegas guy, but it's a cool it's a cool venue for a conference. And uh, I felt like it was, you know, well attended and uh, a good oh, time. Definitely. So you're definitely hitting the conference circuit. It sounds like, man, you guys are uh, keeping busy. We are. Yeah. You know what? Funny, because. I feel like during the pandemic years, it had been so long since I've been to you know either industry conference. And I've got cystic fibrosis. I come from the patient advocacy world, so like typically I spend my days at either rare disease conferences or therapeutic areas. Uh, so this is a, a new suite of conferences for me in the e clinical world. But nonetheless, I feel like I've broken out of a, a cage of the pandemic and suddenly just flying around more than I ever have <laughs> in my entire life, which is which is good. I think things are kind of coming back a little bit. But it's good to to network again, meet people. Fun to meet you, of course, in Vegas before doing the podcast. You know, no longer was I just a random person on LinkedIn, I suppose. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, I think it's always nice to have that. Uh, again, just be able to see somebody and get to know them a little bit. But so I'm going to start out like I always do. I kind of always love to hear about people's kind of backstories, what led them into you know the clinical trial space. It's such a 
it's such a weird industry in a lot of ways. A lot of people don't necessarily set out to work in clinical trials, but get theirs through some sort of peripheral thing. So if you would uh, mm -hmm. just kind of tell us a little bit about your backstory and kind of what brought you into the clinical trial world. Yeah, so I'm a I'm a clinical trial user is what I describe myself as. Uh, I've spent more time uh, in the last decade as a participant in clinical trials than I had outside of clinical trial programs. Like I said, I was, I was born with cystic fibrosis. I was diagnosed in 1993 when I was two years old. Uh, my life in sort of patient advocacy has kind of been my entire life, really. Uh, when I was when I was diagnosed with a condition in '93, my dad was actually in the peak of his NFL career with the uh, New York Jets, and he and my mom founded the Boomer Size Foundation, which to date has raised more than 160 million dollars in the fight against cystic fibrosis, nice. parallel to the National CF Foundation. And for those listeners who may not know much about CF, it's it's really one of the most transformative stories in medicine right now. You know, when I was diagnosed, the life expectancy for most people with CF was maybe late 20s, early 30s. I'm 31 now. And after a series of pretty significant drug breakthroughs over the past couple of years, you know, CF is really no longer a childhood disease and patients are well expected to live very much into adulthood to the point where the kind of running, you know, crude joke in our community is we have to start thinking about CF geriatric care, uh, <laughs> which is kind of a crazy thing. But my life course with CF is was fairly typical for you know for people of my generation. Some up and downs to childhood and things like that. But once I graduated college, my health was, was effectively in a free fall. You know, getting from the bedroom to the bathroom on on some mornings, especially when I was in the middle of a pulmonary exacerbation, was almost impossible to just brush my teeth, let alone going up and down the stairs. Uh, over the course of you know five years, from 2013 to 2018, I, I underwent two dozen medical procedures. I dealt with drug resistant infections that most people with CF sort of really suffer from. And it was all just to kind of keep my head above water. But in 2013, I enrolled into my first clinical trial uh, program. I won't, I won't name the sponsor or the site or anything like that, not, not to name names or, or sort of, you know, pedal to that party here. But it was a pretty transformative experience for me because I got to be part of something that I was that felt bigger than myself. And I was also at a time in my life, I was 22 years old. I was right out of college. I was super sick. I just, the progressive nature of cystic fibrosis was outpacing any benefits that I could gain from my existing treatment regimen. So in some ways I was running out of options, but at the same time, like I wasn't able to start a career. I wasn't able to move off into some city and, and you know, get some job or even have a legitimate social life. Like my college friends were, I was back at home living with my parents, it felt very much like high school all over again. And, and unfortunately, that trial actually failed, but it, it taught me so many different things about the way the healthcare industry treats patients and it treats tr clinical trial participants. In some ways, the trial was actually ahead of its time. There was some remote monitoring that was done in the trial with remote pulmonary function testing. Of course, the device never worked, but it was, it was part of the protocol nonetheless. <laughs> But it also it really taught me that when you live with a rare disease like cystic fibrosis, there's about 40,000 patients in the U.S. that live with the condition. You know, when you're offered an opportunity to be in a clinical trial, it's almost impossible to say no if you can legitimately do it. You know, scientific progress does not happen without participants. And that necessarily means that some participants do have leverage inside the clinical trial ecosystem that I think a lot of participants actually don't know they have. So what better way to, to sort of you know, help change the industry from the inside. You know, fast forward to, to 2018, I enrolled into another clinical trial program. It was my third in about five or six years. And I knew that I was not on the placebo within 12 hours of dosing the drug. Results were so significant that my blood oxygen saturation climbed to 99%, 100%. It had never been that high. Three or four days later, my cough disappeared. And then a week later, I could take my first full breath. So, you know, here we are a couple of years after that. It's, you know, time to, to get dirty. And I want to join a, a startup out of grad school. And that's what led me to Florence Healthcare. Nice. So, I mean, yeah, literally you're coming in as someone whose life has been changed by participation in, in clinical trials, which I think is, I mean, first of all, freaking amazing, uh, just from a, <laughs> just as a human being. Uh, <laughs> but then, you know, secondly, taking that and, and wanting to even further help contribute because there are things affecting millions. Eventually, we'll all be clinical trial patients, as the saying goes, right? You know, one way or another, we're all going to need treatment. We're all going to need uh, <laughs> to use things that have been used through clinical trials. So I'm kind of curious to know if um, your experience as a clinical trial participant and then later, you know, now as you're sort of like seeing how the sausage is made, you know, so to speak, mm -hmm. like how has that maybe changed your your outlook on clinical trials or has yeah. it or, uh, you know, what, what kind of effect has that had on your perspective? 
You know, it's interesting. You know, I, I certainly consider myself like to be a pretty vocal patient advocate, right? You know, the, the trial that I mentioned briefly in 2013, it was clear when I enrolled into it that no one had ever consulted like a sick person living with cystic fibrosis about what it would be like to be in a trial. You know, from the amount of time that we spent at clinic, it was, you know, every other week for six to eight hour visits, it was crazy. Um, you know, I was fortunate that like, well, maybe I wasn't fortunate that, that I didn't really have a career, but it allowed me to actually be in this trial because I didn't have a job that required me to be in the office. But beyond that, the things that I was doing outside the clinic, the journaling, the remote monitoring of my pulmonary function, which just never worked, everything just kind of like felt very, uh, like the processes were, were not linked in any way whatsoever back then. And that was frustrating for me. Uh, so now fast forward 10 years later, I've seen clinical trial design evolve. They've become a lot more patient centric. You know, patients are now actually finally tapped on the shoulder like, hey, would would this, would this idea actually work? Should we actually give you the pulmonary function to do at home? And I, I've seen that really in my own, like, you know, tenure, tenure as, a, as a trial participant. Now on the other side, you know, sort of behind the scenes, the things that patients don't really think about, it is a, I would describe it as a complex web of different, either sometimes related or unrelated things to begin with. And the, my, my key learning actually in the last three months, I joined Florence in, 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 uh, in August, is that you have this trillion dollar, you know, biopharmaceutical industry that is relying on the backs of CRCs, clinical research coordinators that are at the heart of every single trial. Like I have been reaffirmed over and over again that the most important person in the entire trial process is, you know, of course the patient, the human being at the center of it, but the other human being that's in the room and it's the clinical research coordinator. And one of the most recent trials that I've been in, I've actually had three different CRCs in the same trial over six months. Like, so that to me is an immediate problem that needs addressing. Yeah. It's one that I've seen in my, with my own eyes as a participant. Um, yeah. And that's what I was going to ask. I mean, you obviously throughout your participation in trials are dealing significantly with the clinical trial, clinical research coordinator. You know, we, I mean, I still see patients in, in my own company as a, in a coordinator aspect. So yeah, I mean, it's interesting and enlightening, I guess, in ways to hear First of all, it being acknowledged that like really, again, there's no execution without the CRC, but then what effect that has on the clinical trial participant, you know, and sometimes I think that goes yeah. really underappreciated because I mean, frankly, I've said this before, but like sometimes clinical trials are too clinical, you know, we're not providing, it's almost like providing customer service in a lot of ways, <laughs> right? Like, you know, uh, and I feel like, again, that's sometimes a lost on people who don't see patients on a regular or see participants, I guess, on a regular basis. Yeah, it's it's a, it's an interesting dynamic. I don't think I'd ever thought of it through the customer service lens, but I can for sure see that. You know, I think I, I was reflecting on this over the weekend. You know, we had we had our our user conference at Florence Health over the weekend, and I was kind of just talking with some folks down at the conference again, the conference roadshow that I've been on. And it dawned upon me that the most consistent thing of the most recent trial that I've been in is actually the medicine at the heart or the experimental you know, study drug at the heart of the trial. Sure. Uh, because whenever the CRC is changing over or whenever there's a staff ch turnover in the middle of a trial, like the rhythm just changes for every visit, right? Like the way that you communicate the CRC changes, they have their preferred way of doing things. The pattern of the visit, while of course adhering to the protocol, like has wrinkles to it. That just make each visit a little different. You know, it's not like going to see your typical doctor where, you know, the, the, at least for me, a specialist, a cystic fibrosis specialist, like every visit flows the exact same, regardless right. of whatever, you know, I've moved into different, I've been in different cities and I've lived in different places. So I've had different doctors. And one thing that's great about CF is that we have this like unified clinic network where no matter where you are, you should get the same kind of care. But in clinical trial world, it's very, just not that way at all. You know, we might be in the same physical space, the cystic fibrosis clinic where the research is happening, but when every, when something subtly changes, you know, all of a sudden the stress or the frustration or the ease of the clinical trial visit, you know, has different levers and it's changing how it feels to be actually inside one. And I'm not sure that's a good thing, honestly. I'm re I really don't think that's a good thing. No, I mean, that's extremely profound. And again, and maybe even I haven't had that appreciation. I know that, you know, for us, the sort of analog is like having new monitors come on site, right? Like monitor turnover. And like, yes, you're right. We're essentially doing the same basic things, but they have their way. They have their flow. And it can be very upsetting to your flow, you know, uh, to have that change. So it makes perfect sense that that same idea would trickle down to, you know, the participant CRC interaction, 
and you know, we don't have a lot of turnover at my sites, but I can understand mm-hmm. a lot of sites do struggle with that, which mm-hmm. I mean, maybe again, it's underappreciated how much effect that's having downstream on patients who are, you know, I've seen this happen. A lot of patients get participants on patients. I'm going to use them interchangeably, but they really get to have a, a relationship with their CRC. They like yeah. them. They know each other They're uh, And then if you have to say, sorry, there's a new CRC. Well, it's like, you've got to rebuild that trust all, yeah. all over again. And that can certainly put a strain on the participant or it can sometimes even convince them to not want to come in anymore or not be a part of that trial. Now, again, depends on the severity of their disease and, and what have you. But I, I mean, I think that's really, that's really enlightening to hear from uh, patients. I mean, I really, I appreciate that insight a lot. I think that's, again, probably something that gone untalked about. Yeah. You know, I think it's in a world that like mitigates risk as much as possible, right? The, the, the drug development process, like that's my passion in the world is like, how can drugs get from the test tube to the patient as fast as possible? Right. And I see the clinical trials is the stickiest part of it because that's where human beings are involved and human beings are rightfully involved. But the human dynamic, the heart of the drug development process, and especially between the patient and the CRC is a critical thing that's, you know, can it really be trained away? You know, I don't know. Maybe, maybe it can, maybe it can't be. I don't know. You know, I'm not a behavioral economist, <laughs> but I, uh, you know, I do think that that's a, a key part. And really, the last three months of actually working in the e-clinical world and not just being a, a trial participant has taught me that. Right? It's taught me the stress that is put upon these CRCs, and you know, really, it's the 22 or 23 year old grad students. At least that's how it is at my site that are the heroes of the whole thing. Yeah, yeah, no, that that's a fair observation, and I mean to sort of. Uh, go beyond that. I mean, obviously the big talk of the day is, you know, decentralized clinical trials. Uh, ostensibly, those are situations in which there's less interaction uh, with with site staff. Uh, do you feel, I mean, I guess sort of what's your take in terms of your experience as a participant? Do you think that's a, will that be generally <laughs> better accepted? Or do you think that it in some ways puts participants at, at more risk just because to your point, how, how important the CRC role is? Yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I'm, I'm not like willing to not accept that like CRCs that are staffed at retail pharmacies can't recreate those, those, those connections or relationships. With sure. I, I think it can certainly happen. Um, you know, I think about growing up, I had a mom and pop pharmacy down the road from, you know, where I, where I filled all of my medicines and I was a, you know, basically a, a preferred customer, I think. <laughs> right. uh, and, you know, by the time they were set to retire, like, you know, I knew all about their family, their kids and everyone that worked inside the store. Um, so I, I certainly think that that connection can be that can be recreated. I will also say about the future, sh- you know, shift towards the the hot buzz or decentralized clinical trials. I've I've sort of lived the value proposition. Um, so I live on Long Island, at, you know, growing uh, when I was you know 2013, 14, 15, when I was going through uh, you know those early clinical trials that I was in. I was commuting from my my parents' home on Long Island into New York City at one of the cystic fibrosis centers there. And it, I mean, the commute was just brutal, right? Like there'd be days where I'd have eight hour, I basically was doing a work day, eight hour visit. And then I'd have to battle the hour and 15 minute traffic on both ends. So that sucks, right? Like no one wants to go to the doctor to begin with. And yet there I was doing it. And then I went to grad school in New Hampshire at, at Dartmouth College. And I was also, again, I was in a trial up there. I just like can't, like I said, I can't get enough of them. Uh, I was in a trial there and the major medical center associated with the, with the college, which I'm sure you can guess what the name of it is, was also hosting a clinical trial site. And it was literally five minutes from my house, right from where I lived. So being in a clinical trial five minutes away versus an hour and 10 minutes away, there's a clear value that I personally lived. Of course, you know, that trial up, up in New Hampshire wasn't quote unquote decentralized. But what I'm sort of getting at is the, is the geographic capacity to it. Sure. So that, that to me is an immediate benefit that as a participant, like I'll be looking for that in the future for sure, like 100%. I think that also necessarily creates problems in the clinical trial world, uh, but it also hopefully will solve some. You know, I think the thing that I think about a lot from the patient perspective uh, is the capacity at the center of the clinical trial ecosystem, right? Is it capable of advancing drugs as fast as possible? That's the thing that I care about more than anything else. How fast will the drug get from the the test tube to the patient and through the regulators? Like I care about nothing. You know, I care about other things, of course, but like that's the number one priority. And I think, you know, combining that with, you know, the new push to get different trial populations involved in clinical trials necessarily means that needs to be talked about and it needs to be taken seriously. And I I also, you know, I actually wrote about this during the pandemic in in 2020, you know, we were suddenly 
fearful because a bunch of our trials in cystic fibrosis were paused or, right. or put on hold. And uh, that's like a terrifying thing. Like anything that's going to elongate the amount of time that I have to wait for a drug is, is not something that I'm excited about. So, you know, the vulnerability of the brick and mortar single, single source site was a fearful thing that I uh, had to confront and my, my patient population had to confront. So, of course, there's challenges that will come for the decentralized model. But for me, it's a capacity thing. It's a, it's a geography thing. And it's, an, it's uh, a path to, to speed, at least. I'm, I'm hopeful that it will be. Sure. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I don't necessarily disagree. I think it's just really interesting time with so much. <laughs> there's so much discussion around it, but... You know, I don't know that we've seen huge strides quite yet. Um, mm-hmm. So it's sort of that, uh, you know, still kind of climbing up that hype cycle, but really waiting to see what shakes out. And I think there's obviously, I mean, I know you've been in the, the field a relatively short time, but, you know, a lot of uh, risk aversion and, yeah. you know, concerns about regulatory you know, problems that may pop up. But to your point, I mean, ultimately, <laughs> we got to get this stuff done faster, right? I mean, it's embarrassing frankly, that it takes so long to get some of these drugs to market. And a lot of that significant, a part of that b- bottleneck is the clinical trial process. You know, it's just uh, boggles my mind that we're still in this mess. Yeah. You know, I'll, I'll make one more comment on, on the DCT thing. And it's that, so a trial that I recently enrolled in, the protocol was written in such a way that like it could flex to a DCT model if like the situation required it. And I read that and I was like, wow, that's new. I haven't seen that before. I, and I consider protocol, we can get into this in a minute, but I consider protocols like working conditions. That's what I liken them to. They're working conditions for the participant at the central of the trial. But I was like, okay, wow, this is new. And then I continued reading. And then it, as you, as I read through the informed consent, it sort of said, not so clearly, but you could read between the lines and see what was going on. And it was actually like discouraged. Mm-hmm. Like the amount of steps that I would have to go through to flex into the DCT mode seemed like, why would I want to deal with that? Right. Yeah, I think, and that, that's a very fair, I think question that hasn't been answered is how much, what, where's the line between making it easier versus actually making more burden. I mean, now you're your own CRC in, in some ways, right? I mean, you're having to potentially take on more work to make it quote unquote easier. And again, I don't think that's been, that nut hasn't quite been cracked yet, to your point. Because I've seen the same thing in the protocols we run. I mean, there are some, they open up some space for some potential, you know, DCT aspects. But ultimately, it's almost, it's still more of a pain in the ass to do it than it is to just continue to, to run the trial traditionally. And that doesn't seem right, right? Yeah, but, I, you know, I, I agree with you entirely. And I, I think it's, if I if anything, I the last 10 years that I've seen in clinical trials as, as a user, as a participant, I've seen it change so much that I'm confident that, the industry will get it right moving forward, right? I think that's just like the nature of innovation and the nature of just sort of charging into the future. But yeah, I think at the end of the day, everything's going to come down to the protocol, right? What does the protocol call for? What does the protocol mean that, you know, necessitate that the patient has to do? That's the the heart of the, of everything. Sure. Yeah. No, again, that's, that's absolutely true. It'll be interesting to see how protocols continue to evolve to, you know, to account for that, that flexibility. Because again, it's, it's well well past the point of, of needing to do that. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about Florence and uh, kind of your role there. I mean, I think a lot of us probably know about Florence, but uh, what can you say about Florence? Kind of, kind of what, what your uh, what your role there is. Yeah, so uh, you know, I think most people listen to this podcast will, will know exactly what Florence is and who Florence, you know, what Florence does. So, I, you know, I don't need to give the elevator pitch, but my role is uh, I lead I lead patient facing strategy. So, one of uh, Florence's fastest growing products is, is eConsent. Um, so that's something that I think a lot about it. But my my job role really kind of straddles product strategy and market strategy. You know, what do the products need to do? What do they need to look like for patients to to like them? Uh, <laughs> and then you know, how do we how do we think about where where we sit in the market? market. Um, and it's a completely new thing. I, you know, when I was 23 and I was super sick, I never thought I'd, I'd, I'd ever work in a startup. And yet here I am, you know, almost 10 years later. Uh, and it was one thing that I wanted to do right out of grad school was, was actually go find a growth stage startup, something that was growing super fast. Classic business student, I suppose. <laughs> I, 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 think right. that's, I think that's that stereotype right in the nose. But yeah, the last three months have, have been have been a lot of uh, a lot of a listening tour for me. That's kind of what I've called it. Learning how the industry works, what it's like to be inside of a tech company that's growing so fast. And then I think, you know, the next six months is kind of getting a game plan for what I want to do with my role and, and how I 
how I think patients can change things from the inside. Like there's a necessary component of, yeah, I am a patient, I am a participant, and it's impossible for me to uh, disconnect that from my role at Florence. Uh, so that necess- that means that I am something of an advocate still, and you know, I think that's I think it's powerful that Florence is allowing me to do that. But at the same time, it's you know making sure that we're aligned with the company's mission, and that's uh, you know closing the cure acceleration gap and connecting uh, sites and sponsors with, with more meaningful uh, more meaningful interchange. Well, and again, I mean, I I mean, I applaud you guys and you know Florence for having you know someone who's actually been through a series of clinical trials and then now getting into the industry again. It's not that gap isn't always well accounted for, you know what I mean? Like you've got patient advocates and then you've got, you know, sponsor side protocol developers, but not a person who's got the wisdom that comes with having both perspectives. Do you know what I mean? And I think Mm -hmm. that's not something you can replicate without having lived it. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I I think that's awesome. And again, it's a lot of, uh, a lot of companies talk about this stuff, but they don't always put their money where their mouth is when it comes down to it, you know? Yeah, you're preaching to the choir here. <laughs> I think, right. uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, when I was in business school, I sort of formulated this thesis that, uh, you know, early stage companies are companies that are just growing, that are operating in the healthcare world and that serve patients, whether directly or indirectly, right? You know, by serving the society of healthcare, like you're also serving patients indirectly. Um, if you want to truly be patient centered, like you need to give career patients, people with the right qualifications and then train them uh, to actually have the ability to, to have their hands on the strategic levers of the company. Um, I think uh, you, what, what I've seen a lot of, and I've been on the, the other sides of these things, like patient engagement programs or whatever you want to call sure. them. Some, some are great, but more times than not, they're just checking the box, right? I, I've always seen as like those like late stage patient engagement programs or like the sort of shadowy patient advocate advisory board or whatever sometimes it leads to nothing. And in some cases, I, I see that actually as an implicit admission that you thought about it way too late in the game. Uh, And I think that if you want to have a more patient-centered healthcare system broadly, not not just talking about e-clinical, talking about the entire healthcare system in the US or globally, if you want to actually have a patient-centered system, you need to have the people that live these things, that people that have the right qualifications to to change these things at the center of of strategic decision making. I'm not saying people that are like making unilateral choices, but at least having a voice that's heard and and leading to some choices that a company might make. So in some ways, I, I, I see this job opportunity that I have as a proving ground or at least a way to test my hypothesis, check back in with me in a little while to see if it actually works out <laughs> the way that I sort of formulated it. But uh, I agree with you. I think when when Florence uh, came to me and said that this is what they wanted to do and they wanted to get a patient, a user right on board and sort of at the heart of the company, like, how am I supposed to pass that up when that's something that I've been you know barking about as a patient advocate for a decade? Right, right. Yeah. No, it sounds like sounds like a match made in heaven, man. Worked out nicely. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll see. We'll, we will see, right? It's, <laughs> right. Only, it's, only, it's only been three months. I guess we're still in the honeymoon phase. <laughs> there, there you go. Right. Fair enough. Fair enough. I want to switch gears a little bit. Something uh, I, I like to ask every guest that comes on is, uh, you know, I'm really interested in what sort of tools and resources people use to just be, you know, the best at what they do. Uh, uh-huh. You know, whether it be, you know, it does not have to be clinical research related, could be anything, could be breathing technique, could be podcast, could be a book you read, could be a philosophy mm-hmm. you carry with you. But what are some things maybe you would share with the audience that sort of just make you, you know, make you better at what you do? Yeah. So, you know, I think when I started like the real traditional, like true patient advocate world, and I'll bring it back to my life as a CF patient advocate for a moment. One of my first job roles in my family's foundation was to run our scholarship program. And aside from, you know, assisting drug development, research, whatever uh, that we also do, um, we also provide patient financial aid. We, the foundation, provide patient financial aid to, to people with CF that are going through college or going through different things in their lives. And part of that uh, was interviewing applicants. So I, uh, as someone running the, running the scholarship program, got to talk to dozens and dozens and dozens of people with cystic fibrosis every year. And I got to hear about all the pain points, all the things that were going well, everything that was uh, going on in their lives. And then I was able to compare it to everything that I felt as a CF patient. And then I started recognizing patterns like, okay, the doctors aren't listening to me about this symptom, or I feel this way from this drug interaction or this side effect, or I've been trying to get into a clinical trial for three years and I can't for some reason, or I'm, I'm not on the list that the clinic keeps to get patients enrolled as fast as possible. You know, all of these things, I see you're shaking your head, all these things that, you know, you know that exist in the healthcare system, but once you hear people say, you're like, okay, wow, this is a real problem. So to answer your question, I think it's actually that my greatest asset 
to where I've gotten in my career is I think listening to the people that have these problems or, or suffer from these issues and then trying to put action to it. So that's one thing. And then second, um, I've started to think a lot about the drug development process as the benefit that's provided to society, right? So in the drug world, that's like the, the path that a drug takes from like the brand into the generic you know, cycle of, of a medicine. But here in a clinical world, how do I think about it? And it's, it's, it's again, speed. Right. It's what can make things move as fast as possible so that drugs can get to the most possible people as, as able as they're able to. And uh, yeah, I think that's those are the two things that I kind of focus on, right? The societal perspective of, of the healthcare industry, but also listening to people that are at the heart of the problems or have the problems that we want to address. Yeah. And, and again, I think oftentimes undervalued is going to the source, right? And not, and I'm, I'm guilty of it. I'm guilty of making assumptions that, uh, you know, we maybe, all are. You later find out have no real basis in reality until you go. St- That's why, I mean, a large part why I started doing this podcast, just to talk to people and, and start to whittle away some of the false assumptions I've made throughout the years by going straight to the source, talking to people who are living these things. So, I mean, I love that as just a general life hack, <laughs> you know, not, not even a hack, but just a general life uh, philosophy, you know, mm-hmm. if you will. And, you know, the beauty is that there's, even in this industry, there's a growing number of people who are ready and willing to be transparent and to share their perspectives and experiences with you so that, I mean, ultimately this is so that we can <laughs> go to your second goal, which is we want to get this stuff done faster, man. And if we yeah. want to do it, we need to talk about it and figure out, you know, where are these problems and how can we start to fill those gaps? You know, I think my three months, again, I'm, my extremely tenured three months in the <laughs> clinical world, I've learned that this industry has no, and there's no shame in talking about the frustrations that they feel, right? And that's like a great thing, like bringing problems out to the open because that's how problem solving happens. Like I think, you know, too often, like we get into this, like, you know, when I say we, I mean like just human beings get into this place where we don't want to share the things that frustrate us and, you know, we kind of just cover them up and then, you know, hope they go away. But right. the e-clinical world is like they put their problems on the table and everyone knows them. <laughs> like it's just, it's just an unbelievable you know, uh, I think observation that, that I felt, I'm curious if you feel the same way too. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, no, there's, there's no doubt about it. I mean, I think it's gotten, it's gotten better. I don't feel like people always were so willing to be, to talk about these problems aloud, especially for sites, for whatever reason, sites have always, you know, been at the sort of bottom of the chain or felt that way. And even I've still, it still happens to me, you know, I still feel mm-hmm. like, well, I just got to do whatever the sponsor tells me to do. This sucks and I'm just going to keep doing it. But I do feel like we're sort of reaching a new era where step one is maybe like, okay, let's all identify the problems, you know, out loud. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've been uh, accused of being, you know, just a big complainer. And, you know, I can understand why people say that, but really it's because I think we've had this history of not airing our grievances so that we can identify and then start to you know, figure out where those gaps are and fix them. And I think that step one is to be very honest and open with where the problems lie. And it's okay to do that. I don't just complain for the sake of complaining. I mean, I'm, I'm out here running a network every day. I've got as much skin in the game than, as anyone can. But again, it hasn't always been that way. So I'm, I'm glad to hear you have that experience that you feel like people have been very, you know, open and willing to sort of share those grievances. Cause I don't, I don't know that it's always been, that's been the case, you know? Yeah, I mean, I, think, I, I guess I wonder if it's a if it's because I'm coming from the vendor side, right? Where like there's the notion that like entrepreneurs are out to like change the world and stuff. Maybe, maybe not. Maybe I'm sure. Maybe I'm maybe I'm just pontificating. But yeah, I think it's the last several conferences that I've been to. Like, there's the, the discussion of connectivity problems or like fragmentation problems and, and sure. things like that. And those are, of course, big big picture problems that need solving. And look. I, sh- I look at myself as proof positive of a problem that was solved or, or l- m- largely solved, right? Like I was living with a, with a very limited scope of time left on this planet. And then now all of a sudden, you know, here we are t- 10 years later talking. So sure. I, that that's proof positive that, that things can move forward. Um, I want to shift the conversation now. I'll, I'll, I would love to turn the mic around here. <laughs> I'm curious, like if you could wave the magic wand, what would, uh, what would you change about the clinical trial world? I have my own ideas, but I want to hear yours first. Yeah. I mean, if I can be honest, and this is something I espouse pretty frequently is that, you know, I would like to see inclusion criteria more accurately match patient populations so that we can put patients in trials. Um, Mm -hmm. You know, we're doing migraine studies and we should be able to enroll the crap out of a migraine study. Every migraine is like one in seven people in the U S right. Well, 
there's such strict criteria that it's almost impossible to enroll these patients. And I'm sitting, you know, I'm partnered with a guy who sees nothing but migraines all day. And this is just, that's just one example. You know, it's, so for me, I think if we want to speed things up and, and be more equitable and, you know, who's able to participate in these trials, I would love to see the patient population pool opened up more for clinical trial participation. And to me, that may be the single biggest problem. Again, yeah. you know, if, if I'm working in an IBD clinic and we're seeing a hundred IBD patients all day, but I can only put in 0.1% of people in a trial, I, that feels like a problem to me because it's not matching the intended population, yeah. you know, and I, I feel like that's a problem. Yeah. I, I think your, your comments and inclusion criteria are, uh, they strike me as something that I've lived. Uh, you know, when I was, again, 23, trying to get into my first clinical trial because I was running out of options, the inclusion criteria was something that gave me so much stress because my pulmonary function was basically teetering from inside to outside, inside to outside, right, based on, right. on uh, and also with my, you know, my recurrent pulmonary exacerbations, right? In order to get into the trial, I had to have something like two months free of pulmonary exacerbation. But I was at a point in my life where the, the drug resistant bacteria at the heart of CF was just not allowing that to happen. And in order to actually make myself eligible for the trial, like we had to, you know, break out the book, The Art of Medicine, right? Yeah, I kind of had to walk away from the science of medicine to like, let's see what we can actually do to make this work. And that begs the question, right? Like, was I actually at like baseline health when I got into this trial? Or was I basically just geared towards gearing my entire health to like just two months to make it to two months to get into this trial? And right. you bet you bet you better damn well believe it that as soon as I blew my pulmonary function to get over the inclusion criteria and make it across the finish line, I left the trial site, drove down the the road, parked my car at interventional radiology and had a pick line put in so that we could treat a pulmonary exacerbation that was just about to come on. Yeah, see, and that yeah, that, and that's a that's a shame. I mean, that should not be the case. Right. And it was and and it's what happened, right? And it's right, what happens, right. you know, it permeates, especially in these rare terminal diseases where like trials are, you know, in some cases the only path forward. I think the thing that I would change about clinical trials is the way reimbursement is seen as a taboo. <laughs> you know, it's a yeah, little bit yeah, of a, a taboo thing. So for sure. You know, I, I think that pay should be increased, like base pay should be increased. Like there's no reason why a healthy volunteer should be paid more than a terminal patient in a phase two. Like I don't get that. Like that's but, like the yeah. most idiotic idea ever. And I'm sorry if I like if I said if I said a bad word, but like no, that no, to me no, is just no. like crazy. You're, you're dead on. I mean, look, we, you know, we deal with a, I'm in Oklahoma city. There's a lot of rural area. Uh, people can't take it. I mean, these are, you know, farmers sometimes these are people who, you know, can't lose a whole day. They got to get childcare. They may not, they're not going to get paid. They got to take a day off work and we're saying, well, here's 50 bucks. Well, I mean, that's kind of bullshit, right? I mean, that's not covering even the expense of just getting there, you know? We want them to fast, so then they got to go get something to eat afterwards. Again, we're we're not doing enough. I mean, in terms of not even just straight up cash reimbursement, but again, getting them here, get them a ride here, get them feed them, do it, whatever we got to do to get them, make it easy for them. So I'm with you 100 percent there. And to me, my perspective is that the ROI for a sponsor to reduce the amount of time. Let's say that you know we got we're talking about. I'll create a case study, but like let's say we're talking about a drug company here that's pre that's pre-revenue, they have one asset that they're moving through the clinic and they're betting the company on that on that single asset, right? Any day that that company spends less in the pre-revenue stage is an immediate ROI return. So if you can actually speed up a clinical trial by just a matter of days, by doing some of these things to get patients involved, to maybe to make them more excited about clinical research. And this, by the way, is not coercion, right? Like you're trying to do something good for the population, for these people. So I, I, you know, I think that is just a, like a, a very simple, it's a simplified case. Study, I understand that, but it's just an example of like how that should actually work. Right. I mean, if you, there's a, I was, I was reading a report from, the, uh, from bio over the weekend that shows you like the, what I read on the weekends, I guess, but, <laughs> uh, and it, it talked about like the amount of time and, and sort of the chance of success or the chance of approval by stage and, and over the, the years, right? Like, you know, me looking at that, I'm like, this is ridiculous. Like as, as, as medicine advances through phases, the, the likelihood of approval continues to rise. Yet people that are living with terminal conditions are tied to the scientific race is what I call it, the scientific race to approval. And yet there's got to be a way to tighten that time, shorten it in some meaningful way that makes sense for a sponsor to, you know, just absorb some extra costs. I mean, a company 
people think about the cost of clinical trials just by the cost of running a trial. But if you're talking about a pre-revenue sponsor, a drug company, that company is already burning $100 million a year just to operate, right? We're talking about drops right. in the bucket here just to get a few more patients faster into the trial. So, and, and you know, I get I get the, the concerns with risk and, and regulatory concerns. But I think when we talk about like trials that exist in the real world for real people doing real things, living with real health conditions, these are just some of the steps forward. So um, I hear you on the inclusion criteria. That's also something that I would change if I could do the magic wand. But two is, uh, you know, the the cost structure that sort of at the center for patients can trace its entire way back to the ROI for drug makers or for sponsors to, to push these things just a little faster, I think. Yeah, no, I, I, again, I do not disagree at all. And I, I do, I've noticed some more conversation about that lately, it seems like, uh, which I mean, is a good thing because I'm with you. Mm-hmm. I mean, even at Magi, when I was there, I found it really interesting to see the split in the room about some of these topics, One th- that being one of them. Were you in the IRB room when I asked the question and was, uh, it was, it, it was sort of like a pariah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I don't know if it was that one or not, but I just, a, a couple of like, literally like you can see the room like divided between like, whoa, well, that's, that's unethical. And other one saying, well, no, it's not, it's real, it's practical and real, you know yeah. what I mean? So I, I think it's even just interesting that it's still such a point of contention when, I mean, again, to me and sounds like to you, it's fairly fairly obvious that what we should, what we should be doing. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, it is. And it's, you know, I think I believe me, I'll, you know, I'll play the, the devil's advocate of understanding and mitigating the risks of, you know, the things that ethicists may hold or uh, the risks of nat- souring a potential billion dollar drug franchise, because you may be, you know, sort of fudging around some of the regulatory stuff because of this increased pay and increased, you know, uh, emphasis on, on accessibility, which is sort of contradictory because everyone wants more accessibility. So <laughs> right. um, I, I think it's a sticky conversation, but I, again, I come from the world of advocacy and change comes when people talk about it broadly. And I think that's the step that we're in right now. And I'm hoping, you know, in the next sort of era of trials that we're about to step into, it's, it's a, there's a magnifying glass. Yep. No, I'm, I'm with you. Gunnar, it's been a awesome conversation, dude. I feel like you've got a, you got a bright future here. If you decide to stick in the, uh, the clinical trial space, uh, where can uh, people find you online? I appreciate it, Brad. People can see me on Twitter at G17 Assias. And and then I, uh, of course, have my own website, GunnarAssiason.com. And uh, yeah, that, that's where they'll they'll see me. If, if not at a conference on the roadshow that uh, that we all seem to be on. Although hopefully that, that's coming to an end here before the winter starts up. So. Sure. Uh, yeah. If you see him, go go give him a high five. You know? Yeah. <laughs> all right, Gunnar, I appreciate you coming on, man. And we'll, uh, I may hit you up about doing a live stream on top of this. I've been trying cool. to sort of... Uh, layer uh live streams after podcast release but I'll, I'll get with you on that and otherwise uh again man i really appreciate you coming on yeah awesome it was, it was awesome to be on this thanks for having me absolutely as always thank you so much for listening to note to Fa podcast make sure and check us out at note to file podcast.com uh, for episode transcripts show notes and guest contact information 